Morning, church. Uh, Greetings from the way that we're doing our services again. So it's good to be here again to give you God's word and the message for today. Let's jump right into it. Uh, I had started the series on 2 Corinthians, and I thought it would be um, a time now that I would just end that book with a short summary of chapter 13, where we had left off. And I want to finish off by saying this as we transition. I'm going to do something a little different this morning into a new study. We looked at 2 Corinthians and Paul had explained what was going on in Corinth and all the trials and how he was an apostle. And he comes to the end of this book now. And as we finish this book in a short summary, you can look at it at your time. He talks about four things in the last few verses of there. He finishes with the first thing, a warning. He says, I'm coming again to Corinth. There's no more loose talk, no more reckless statements. He's going to deal with the issues now. In other words, what what we say in America, a showdown is about to come. He's going to address the problems. And, you know, folks, there's a time when trouble must be faced, and Paul's going to do this. Then he finishes with the second thing. He finishes with a wish. He wishes now that they will do the right thing. He doesn't like showing off his authority for the sake of just showing off authority. Paul always had in mind that he wanted to build up the church and not destroy them. His aim was in the discipline was to build up and not destroy. Third thing he finishes with, he finishes with a hope. He hopes they'll go on to perfection to being more like Jesus Christ. Because he realized the man who is not advancing is backsliding. The Christian man is a man who is always on his way forward looking to God. And therefore, each day by the grace of Jesus Christ, he must be a little more fit to stand in God's scrutiny. And that's what he wishes. You know, it takes a big man to listen to hard advice. He hopes now that we'll live in this agreement and peace in harmony of love. No congregation can worship the God of peace in the spirit of bitterness, he'll tell us. We must learn to love each other before our love of God has any reality to an outward-looking world. And then finally, he's going to finish with this last thing. After the severity and struggle and the debate, there comes this serenity now. He's going to bring a calmness. He's going to give a benediction. You know, one of the best ways I've learned to actually deal with your enemies or have peace with them in your mind is to actually pray for them. No one can hate a man that he prays for at the same time. And so Paul's going to leave the trouble story of, of, of 2 Corinthians. He's going to leave this in its current state with a benediction that will ring in the ears. He's going to leave them with a short homily ending this book. The way has been hard throughout the book for what he has shown us, but his last word is now peace to the church. Now, in transitioning from there, as Paul talked about warnings, we now are going to look, and I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Hebrews, the book of Hebrews chapter 1. While you're doing that, I will pray. Lord, as we come to you this morning, we ask you make the book live. Show us thyself through thy word. Show us our Savior and show us ourself. And make the book live for Christ's sake. Amen. Well, I want this morning now um, to begin with this series of studies as we move into this new book of Hebrews. And if you will note, if your Bible's open, and it should be, if you flip through it, you realize now there, there are some 13 chapters. And it therefore holds the potential to becoming a long series, uh, running series because of the books and, and what's contained in them. Well, I want to try to avoid that because I don't want to deal with the book on the level of very, very deep detail. However, I do want to deal with it carefully and properly. Now, I haven't decided yet, but I might 
spend a little time and park our car on certain chapters and points in the book and tackle it more seriously as we're going through it. But we're going to do it this way because it, I'm going to give it the kind of attention that is necessary and at the same time prevent it from being too long and drawn out and become longer than expected. The seriousness of the material in the book of Hebrews demands uh, very careful attention. Even though we're going to fly at a very high speed and fast, we need to, uh, however, simply monitor what we're looking at as we go along through the book together. So let's begin this morning by set it up, by beginning first of all with a quote. And this is a very staggering quote from a book called Pilgrim's Progress. I suggest you read it. Uh, I can get you a copy, but it is very helpful in your Christian walk. It was a book written by uh, a man named Bunyan who was in prison. Then he wrote this book from prison. But he's going to talk about something here about the pilgrimage of Christianity. And, and he refers to this one character uh, that he previously he will, he will mention throughout the book. And the character in that book that he talks about refers to as that character as ignorance. And he describes the circumstances relating to the end of ing- ignorance's pilgrimage or his walk. And this is what he says in the book. He says this, Then I saw that there was a way to hell even from the gate of heaven, as well as from the city of destruction. Then I saw there was a way to hell from the gate of heaven. Now that demands careful attention. It's a sobering thought. And it is, as we, we shall see, a biblical truth. And, and we're going to find that. And perhaps there is no other book which contains more warnings regarding this issue than in the book of Hebrews. You know, every Christian should know the book of Hebrews is full of dire warnings, and it's also full of glorious promises. So it's therefore important that we not only do we enter the joyful acceptance of the promises we are given and embrace them, but we also need to pay careful attention to the warnings which are sounded off in this book. And the primary warning which is sounded is a warning to men and women who are in danger of slipping from their original commitment. It's a warning to those who are actually in danger of drifting. You look at chapter 2, verse 1. The writer says we must pay careful, more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. Now, a summary of the book, a short one, uh, as time allows... The writer of the book is unidentified, despite the fact that a lot of people spend a tremendous amount of time trying to figure out who it is. And while there be a measure of some curiosity in that, it it's actually profits us minorly. There's, there's not a lot of profit in it. God wanted to leave it for us, the record of the writer. He would have left it and recorded it for us in the Holy Scripture, but it isn't. Interesting, interestingly, there is... No destination of this letter recorded for us. That's another matter of speculation by many. Nor is the group of people to whom the book is written can actually clearly be be defined to us. The title, the book of Hebrews, the Hebrews, was a title which actually was later added in the early centuries and clearly points to the fact that the group that the letter was written to was largely a group of Judaistic Jewish believers. Largely Jewish audience who had embraced faith in Christ, but maybe not exclusively. There could have been Gentiles. And once again, the commentators go to great lengths to argue this, of if this was true. Was it exclusively a Jewish audience or a Gentile audience or whatever else they might come up with? But the fact is that where any plainness or truth comes, it comes out of the reading of the text itself. And so we can be sure as we go through and we begin to build a picture of our own, we will be able to clarify what the reader is conveying. However, we can say with clarity that the writer confronts his readers with the serious implication of refusing to listen to God's word or refusing to listen to God's heeds or warnings. For example, go to verse 15 and look at chapter 3, verse 15. The writer will say this here, that is, As has just been said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. 
Now, at that point, he's quoting the Old Testament in Psalm 95, and he's making a reference to the people making the journey uh, out of uh, the people of God out of, um, in the Exodus, in the Old Testament, from the liberation of bondage in Egypt to the land of Canaan and to the promised land. And if you look in other parts of the New Testament, the New Testament writers actually use Old Testament pilgrimage models or examples for us of what was involved in the Christian living back then. And therefore, he says it's vitally important that we do not follow the examples of our forefathers. Because out of the great number that had made wonderful beginnings, tremendous professions of following God, later we find there was a great moral decline. Now, that comes across clearly. You look at the end of chapter 3 in Hebrews where there, there are these three striking questions the writer comes out with. In, in verse 16, just look at it right there with me. He says there, who were they who heard and rebelled? So who are these people that rebelled? And then he goes on to say, were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? Now we're going to come back to that, but for one moment after uh, we look at these questions, let's look at the second question in verse 17. He says, and with whom was he angry with for 40 years? Was it that not those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the desert? And that's where 600,000 people died in the wilderness as a result of God's intervening judgment. And thirdly and lastly, and to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest? Answer, to those who disobeyed. In verse 19, the explanation is here, so we see, he says, that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Now here we got individuals, they started out on a journey, and along the journey they begin to slip and slide, they begin to depart, they begin to drift, and, and the commitment that had marked them in the beginning, in the early days, began to dwindle, dwindle and diminish and actually go away. And the writer of the Hebrews says this, I want to warn you about the very same thing happening in your life. I want to make sure that you do not end up like them. Now, some of you who understand our faith can be immediately puzzled and questioned because you might say to yourself, have we not determined in our biblical exposition in our church that we believe in the preservation of the saints? That we believe in the preservations of the saints? Philippians 1, 6, it says this, that I am confident that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion on the day of Jesus Christ. Is that not what we taught and we affirm and believe in this place? Absolutely and unequivocally. But listen, such affirmations, such statements do not make a fiction out of these warnings. These are real warnings to real people who had made real professions. Now, let me try to emphasize. I want to set this up for you. For example, look at chapter 2 again, verse 1 to 3. The writer says here, we must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard. Now, the question is why? So that we do not drift away. In other words, it's possible to drift away. Obviously, he would never mention it. He wouldn't have spoken about it. And then he goes on to say, For if the message spoken by angels was binding and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how then shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? Now, many people use this for evangelism, it is not an evangelistic statement or a verse for people coming to faith in Jesus Christ. That is a word of warning to those who had professed faith in Jesus Christ. And then we go further on to chapter 3, verse 6, and, and he says, we are in his house. And then go partway through the verse. How do we know we're in his house? Answer, if we hold on to our courage and the hope of which we boast. Go up down to verse 12. Uh, same chapter, see to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful and unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. You getting the picture here? Is it starting to make sense? He says, guys, you better look out. Because if you read church history, you find there was a whole crowd of people in the beginning who were bold in their affirmations. You would have believed that they would have held out. They were loud in their proclamations. But in the end, they drifted. They never entered into the rest promised by God. And he says to the readers, I want to warn you, to those of you who are reading this letter, 
not only to the readers there in that day, but in today's contemporary world. Even all the way down through the corridors of time, he says, now, today, I'm speaking to you. I want to talk to you. Hey, Grove Point Calvary Church, you better make sure that you do not have a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. That's what he's saying here. He goes on in chapter 6, verse 11. We want each of you to show the same diligence to the very end. Why? Well, he said it. In order to make your hope sure. We don't want you to become lazy, he says. But imitate those who through faith persevered with patience and inherited the promise which was given by God. Now, we can go on and on and on. If you go to chapter 12, you don't have to flip there. We'll get to it eventually. But notice in verse 25, he says this. See to it that none do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? So he argues from the lesser to the greater. He argues from the then to the now. And his argument is compelling. It's striking in a fearful way. These individuals, folks, are not different than us. They woke up every day like you and I. They faced temptations. They knew what it, was, what it was like to wake up and something hit them from nowhere. And for them to say as they went through their journey of faith that at times, do I really believe what I believe? They understood what it was to be buffeted and beaten down by the culture around them who didn't believe by, by the thoughts and ideas of folks, had no interest into their lifestyle for God at, uh, and their professions of faith whatsoever. And so what had happened was they began to slowly become discouraged, disillusioned. They began to sing songs that were unbelievable songs from the lips of those who were freed from Exodus. How do we know this? For example, go back into the Old Testament, Exodus 15, we know that. They're singing a song there. Exodus chapter 15, they're singing the song of Moses and Miriam. It's the song of redemption after being freed. And they're, they're running around singing and they're probably saying something like this. Oh man, I'm so glad we're freed from Egypt. Boy, it was rough there. We are so grateful, Lord. But then one chapter ahead, verse chapter uh, 16 of Exodus, they began to sing another song. And that turned into a song of grumbling. Halfway through the first verse of chapter 16, it says in there, on the 15th day of the second month, after they had come out of Egypt, very short period of time, it says in verse 2, in the desert the community grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the Israelites said to them, if we only had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. In fact, if we think about it, Egypt was pretty good compared to what we're at now. There was nice restaurants, we had Jollibees, we had Lento, we had... We had Insanal. I mean, we used to sit around all day and eat the pots of meat and the unlimited rice that was given. We had unlimited food that we wanted. And now we started this journey and we're all starving to death. I think we'll just go back is what they were saying. I think we should just go back. Now, at this point, get rid of the Pharisee mode that, clean, that, that begins to rise up in your mind. And start to say something like this. I, I would never do that. Oh, that would never happen to me. Take that out for just one moment and be honest for once. Can you identify this morning with this? You ever feel like chucking your faith? You ever feel like giving up? You ever go through a day or wake up and say, I can't take this any longer? I've just, done a, I just had about enough of this journey that I can handle anymore. You ever face the fiery darts of unbelief that lodge right into your brain? and call into question the profession that you made the day that you came to know the Lord Jesus Christ, ones that you held dear to for long periods of your life? You ever felt that issue? You ever thought that? Well, you ever had the ideas that the Christians that, that are around you ever been so beat up and buffeted by people who call them Christians were not so nice as the people you left behind when you used to go to the resto bar and, and hang out at the pub or, or, or before you were even converted, your family of people you hung out with. And then you begin to say to yourself, how did I get involved with these people? They're a bunch of crazy people. They're not even that nice. I had nicer friends then. We had a nice time. We were always laughing. We'd go out and we'd share a lot of fun. We'd have snacks and cake and the whole thing. Man, that was great. 
you know what? I think I'd like to go back to that life. Now, if you're honest, first of all, you will admit that you have had the tendency in your own life and in your own heart to do the same thing. And the words of the hymn writer sing it so well, and I'll sing it right now for you. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Take my heart, O take and seal it. Seal it to thy courts above. In other words, what you're saying is, God, you better keep a hold of me. You better hold on to me. And if you're not prepared at this moment to see that in yourself, you'll find it in others that you look at in their lives because there have been those along the journey of fate who have taught the Word of God, and you know them, and I've known people who have taught the Word of God, maybe have taught you the Word of God. They don't even go to church anymore. They've just given up. You don't even know where they are. We don't even know if they're Christians anymore. You don't see them around. They used to be in the forefront of the ministry and no more to be found. They were on charge. They were on fire. They were the ones, maybe, who led you to Christ. We know stories of ones now that they left their wives, they left their kids, they're here, they're there, they're everywhere. We don't even know where. And you're saying to yourself, what is this? What happened? I tell you what it is. It is somebody who never listened to this book and its warnings. It's somebody who, who said in their walk, I'm okay, I'm fine. That will never happen to me, not me. Those Israelites were silly people. I'm not like them, but it will never happen to me. The book of Hebrews said, listen to the warnings. You better listen. Loved ones, these warnings are realistic. They are there in order that they would bring and make us fearful to fall in the hands of an angry God. They're not there describing, they're not there describing other people. This is not for somebody else. Chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands. Now notice, let us be careful. Let us be careful, so that none of you may be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the gospel preached to us, just as they did, but the message they heard was of no value to them, because those who heard it did not combine it with faith. Now that's the practical implication. It's not simply of hearing the gospel, which brings final salvation, but it is the appropriation of the gospel of faith. Now what does that mean? It means believing and receiving. John 1.12 signifies it clearly. Clearly, to as many as received him, they believed on his name. Believing and receiving. And it is a genuine faith. Then it will be a persistent faith and a persevering faith. And that's what he says here. And one of the ways that our faith perseveres is by paying attention to the warnings in the book. That the warnings that are in Scripture to act as those goats and guides that, that, you know, if you ever go take a trip on Ocean Jet and you get on a boat, when you go on your little trip or your vacation and, and the boat becomes to, it needs to come into dock, it begins, begins to bang on those rubber things next to the dock. They have those things there that bump it back into line so the boat would actually come into the pier and straighten out. So when it comes in straight, you can leave the boat, depart from it, or, or get on it if you're going towards somewhere else. That's what the warnings of God are doing here. That's what they do. For example, once again, the book, Pilgrim's Progress, and, and I encourage you to read it, or, or, or look at the movie, the, when Ignorance, now the character we talks about, talks to the main character, Christian, about Ignorance's apparent profession of faith. He puts it like this. This is now Ignorance speaking. He says, I believe that Christ died for sinners and that I shall be justified before God from the curse. Now, pretty good, isn't it? That might be enough to just get us into the membership of Growth Point Calvary Church, fill in if we had an application. If you just stop at that point, sounds great. Unfortunately, ignorance doesn't stop. He doesn't stop at that point. He says this, I believe that I shall be justified before God from the curse through his gracious acceptance of my obedience to the law. I'll be justified from the curse because God is accepting me because I'm obedient to his law on the grounds of my entry into heaven. Or, thus, Christ makes my duties that are religious acceptable to Christ, to God the Father, by virtue of his merits, and so shall I be justified. 
Now, we can spend a long time talking on that. We're, we're not going to do that because that's the very thing that is the heart of the issue be de- between the evangelical Roman Catholic Church talk on this issue. What is the nature of genuine justification? It is grace infused to a person whereby they become good people and then God accepts them into heaven on the basis of the good deeds they do as a result of the infusion of grace. No. Bunyan says that is absolutely not true. And, he, and he's very clear. And this is how Pilgrim answers him. He says, let me give an answer to this confession of thy faith. Number one, thou believest with a fantastical faith, for this faith is nowhere described in the Bible. Number two, thou believest with a false faith because it taketh justification from the personal righteousness of Christ and applies it to thy own. Number three, this faith make it not Christ the justifier of thy person, but of thy actions and of thy person for thy actions' sake, which is false. And number four, therefore this faith is deceitful, even such as it will leave thee under wrath in the day of God Almighty. And then I saw there was a gate to hell from the very entrance of heaven. But the ultimate question, how then are we to ensure that you and I do not drift away? That's the question. That's the question. And if I hadn't made that question clear to you, either I'm not speaking or you're not listening. But I'm saying to you, the book of Hebrews has been written to potential drifters of the faith. It has been written to us who think, to those of us who think that we can stand and we will never fail or in greatly need of these warnings today. Next question, how then are we to be able to ensure, in other words, how are we to ensure that in the end of the day, through our walk, that we will finish the course, that we would press towards the goal, towards the prize of the upward calling heavenly in Christ Jesus? Well, the answer is described for us here, given to us in 2.1. Chapter 2, verse 1, he says, We must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. In other words, we need to pay careful attention to what we have heard, so that we do not drift. The Word of God has been given to God's people in order for us to pay attention and listen to it, obey its commands, accept its promises, heed its warnings, so that you and I may not drift. The thing is, when an, whenever an individual begins to drip, drift from their profession of faith, they first will drift from the Word of God. And it often goes like this. Well, you know what? I go to worship service, and you know what? I'm singing, and you know what? I don't even really hear God's voice, and, and I don't hear Him speaking to me. And they have these explanations. They blame it on this person or that person that caused them. But let it be set down as a truth here, an unequivocal truth, that a backslider backslides as he or she drifts from the Word of God. And this is what happens then next. Their backsliding becomes compounded when they begin to ignore the Word of God. And their backsliding is most devastating when they actually begin to resist the very Word of God which calls them back to repentance. Now, verse 2 of chapter, verse 1 of chapter 2, that was the introduction. That's going to send us now into the opening uh, chapter, chapter 1, verse 1, which of course, you have every right to believe we should start there. And now we're here and we'll start there. So, what is the writer saying? What have we heard? What have we heard? What are we paying more careful attention to what we heard? Well, what we have, what have these people heard? Is, in other words, what is, what is he saying? What is it that we have heard? Chapter 1 explains it very well. Let's begin. You go right back to verse 1, chapter 1, and we discover all that we know about God does not come from a result of making up our own reason of who he is, but an account of a self-disclosure revealed in Scripture itself. So the writer now begins to remind you and I that God spoke the universe into existence. It was born by his powerful words. And throughout history has spoken progressively and diversely through the prophets. And the prophets were preparing the way for God to complete the final word to us that comes not in a series of suggestions or opinions, but it comes in the person. Look at verse 2. In the last days he has spoken to us by his son. In other words, in Jesus Christ, God declares, here's my final word on the subject. 
I got nothing else to say further beyond this. This is my final word. And in his coming, Jesus ushered in the last days with that. And when he returns with, in the clouds with great glory, he's going to wrap up these last days for good. Now, the writer says you pay careful attention to this because you're going to start meeting all of these crazy people in your life. And they're probably coming out now where they're going to tell you, I got these pamphlets. I have a special word from God. Uh, in these last days, I'm going to tell you how this looks like that God is coming today. And they want to tell you they have a special word from God for these last days because we are in the last days due to this virus situation. Well, here's the answer that you can tell them. Thank you, but no thank you. Because I understand Hebrews chapter 1 says, in these last days, which we find ourselves now, God has spoken to me through his word, his son. And that ought to be your answer. You know, I've had many people many times, and I'm sure you have too, coming up and tell you, I got to find a word from God for you. And then they'll turn the question around and they'll ask me, hey, do, do you have a final word for me from God? And I'll say, yeah, here, right here. It's my final word. And they'll say, no, 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 no. Do you have a final word from God? And I'll say, yeah, absolutely, right here. This is my final word. That's what I have for you. They say, well, what is it? I said, it's in the Bible. Well, no, 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 I don't want a, none of those. Do you have a final word? I mean, like, do you have a word for God in these last days? And I say, yeah, it's in the Bible. I tell you, if you're running around looking for a special word of God, then you're not listening to the word of God that we have in the Bible. And if you're doing that this morning, I'm going to tell you, you're in great danger of slip sliding away. You're in danger of drifting. God says, you want to hear my last word on this subject? It's not in a theory. It's not in somebody's uh, special word. It is in a person. And he makes that very clear here. My last word on this subject is Jesus Christ. Now, the writer is going to com compress now this tremendous truth in a, in, a, in a tremendous amount of theology. He's going to begin to give us now a Christology in a few verses. And I want to run it through you as best I can. And I want you to pay careful attention because in today's world, we have these Christians who don't give Jesus the place that is afforded to him in Scripture. They got this great idea of, of who he is apart from what the Bible says. We're going to look at this morning seven things concerning which are told in Scripture concerning Christ the Son. Number one. Now, I want you to circle certain words just as I did in doing this. Number one, that He is the heir of all things. Circle the word heir. I want to draw your attention to these so that you might have a sense of the word to which you are to pay most attention to. Begin to circle the, the seven different words. The first word is heir. He says, chapter 1, verse 1, In these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things. And in other words, uh, there's a commentator who wrote Lenski. He writes this, quote, From all eternity and thus at the very creation, when time began, God made, God made his Son the heir of all things, not according to his deity, which could inherit nothing, but according to his humanity, which could inherit and did inherit all things. He is the heir of all things. And you have the story of when the angel comes to Mary in chapter, Luke chapter 1, verse 32. It's the wonder of all that took place there during that, um, that altercation with, with the angel. He said there in verse 32, He, speaking of Christ, He will be great. He will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord will give Him. Give Him. He will inherit. He will become the heir of of the Lord will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom will never end. When Jesus stands um, in the closing days of his ministry and he begins to address the questions in John 16, cha uh, chapter 16, verse 15, he says to, to the people, all that belongs to me, all that belongs to the father is mine. He is the heir of all things. You've got all these contemporary notions uh, on who Christ is. He's a Deepak Chopra. He's a great world leader, a mystical figure, who is a kind man, who's a teacher, who's actually a baby in a manger. All those things, all that stuff, eventually will have to bow down to the instruction, the clear instructions of God's word. One day it will. So who is this Christ? He is the heir of all things. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills and the wealth in every mine. 
He owns the rivers and the rocks and rills and the sun and the stars that shine. Wonderful Savior, only tongue can tell. He is this Jesus, and I love him well. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills, and I know that he cares for me. You see, this is what doctrine does for us, because when I'm weary and I'm, I'm in despair and I'm feeling the whole world crushed down by the events of life on me that are surrounding me, I'm fearful of my future. I have burdens on my heart that I, that I cannot get rid of or alleviate. Whom do I go? Where do I go? Well, I tell you, somebody bigger than you and I. Who made the mountains? Who made the trees? Who made the rivers run through the seas? Who hung the moon in the starry sky? Somebody bigger than you and I. Now, who made the flowers to bloom in the spring? Who writes the songs for the robins to sing? Who sends the rain on the earth when it is dry? Somebody bigger than you and I. When I'm weary and filled with despair, who gives me courage to go on from there? Who gives me faith that will never, ever, ever die? Well, I'll tell you, somebody bigger than you and I. I go to Christ. That's where I go. Who is the Christ who I, whom I go to? He is the heir of all things. He owns the whole deal. So when you read in the paper and, and all the economy now is, are, are crushing down on us or being destroyed because of the virus and, and all of your savings won't be worth anything, anything to you, well, you say this, well, I understand all that, but I'm a joint heir of Christ, Romans 8, 17. He owns the whole shooting match, everything. When you're running around Bahal and, and I know these people are out there and you have these people trying to sell you these retirement investment plans, wanting, wanting you to invest with them. Well, pay attention to that as best you can. But remember this. He is the heir of all things. Okay? Secondly, he is God's creative agent. The whole creative universe of time and space was made by God through his son. Isn't that what it says here? Look at your Bible. Through whom he made the universe. You know, this is very similar to the prologue of John 1.13 where it says, Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. And Paul writes to the, the Colossae church. He affirms the same truth. He says this, For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or author authorities, all things were created by him and for him. Who took, bread, who took fish and bread and hungry people fed? Who turned water into wine? Who made well the sick? Who made see the blind? Who touched the earth with feet divine? Only Jesus. Only Jesus. You read the commentaries on, out of the late... 19th century, early 20th centuries, and they're trying to explain how these miracles ever really happened because they, want, they, they don't want to believe what, what was written and they stumble into these things. They don't want sensible men and women uh, coming up with these preposterous claims that in the Galilean carpenter could take five loaves and two fish and transform it into a brunch for a company of five or 10,000. They don't want to believe that that happened. And so they make up this nonsense on the story. As soon as this little boy gave some of his food, everybody began to pull out of their food and start to give and give and let everybody eat. It came out of everywhere and so suddenly everybody was fed. And they went on later to say, you know what? Let's just call this a miracle because it'll make it Jesus look good. <laughs> what a bunch of ridiculous nonsense. If he is the creative agent of the whole universe, what's lunch for 5,000 out of two, two loaves? And some fish. He's the heir of all things. Just like that. Doesn't matter. And you see, loved ones, this is why some of you who are smart, and I know some of you are very smart, some of you are going to be successful in, in your careers and what you're doing. You have the capacity in that area to excel. I understand that. But you're going to have to bring your mind under the truth of God's word and this has to be your starting point for everything in explanation because all of that scientific reason, if you believe in that, that has to be put in position on these truths. These truths do not fight for acceptance on the basis of scientific theory or reasoning because one day at the end of the day when the brightest scientist's brains had the coach cracked for them, they're going to be on their knees like everybody else before Christ and they will declare him at that time, Lord of the universe, that he has made. He is the creator of all things. Let the school say what they want to say. 
Let him say, don't be bothered by that. Don't be annoyed. Don't be arrogant about it. Don't be shouting and fighting with people and brawling and screaming. Just understand that Jesus, to whom you've committed your life, he is the heir of all things, and he is the one that has created everything, the whole universe. And you know what? You know him personally. And better stet, better still yet, he knows your name and mine. Thirdly, he is the radiance of God's glory. Who is this Jesus? He is the radiance of God's glory. The glory of God was a visible expression of the presence of God. You get this? Where? In the Old Testament. Many times. We could look at one of them right now. Exodus chapter 32. You could read it later if you want. The writer says there, Listen, all of God's greatness, all of His majesty shines through His Son. Christ is the light of God burning and shining. John in his prologue again, you see it, John 1, 14, and we have seen his glory, the only glory, the begotten Son, the Father, begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Fourthly, he is the exact representation of his being. Look at verse 3. We're there now. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. So the Son, we're told, truly and fully shows us the character of God. He is God. He is, he is the visible God to us. When we see what the Son is like, we see exactly what God the Father is like. That's why Jesus was able to say, who He who has seen me has seen the Father. No one has ever seen God, but God and the one and only who is at the Father's side has made Him known. John 1.18 You see, there's no private side to God that it's kind of obscure and some, uh, behind some public side, and it has been revealed in Jesus Christ. We have seen the truth and the full character of God made open and clear to us in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Fifthly, He is the sustainer of the universe. In other words, He's the one who holds all things together and sustains by His powerful word. Not only is the inheritor of all things that, that have been instrumental in, in making but at the present time, he's holding everything together by his powerful word, Colossians 1.17. In him, all things hold together. In the miracles in the gospel record us the, the, just foreshadowings of this. Christ breaks into the normal course of events and he shows the dimension of God as they go out on their boats. And you remember the story and the storm starts to break out in the Sea of Galilee and they're looking at one another fearfully and wondering what's going on. They look and they see Jesus asleep on the boat there. They wake him up and say, hey, Lord, Lord, don't you care about what's happening here? Okay, well, look what's going on here. And Jesus rubs the sleep from his eyes. He stands up. He looks at the sea and he tells the sea, shh, stop, cut it out. That's enough. And suddenly the sea becomes calm. They look at one another and they say, what manner of man is this? that even the wind and the sea and the waves obey him. Who is this? He's the one who upholds the universe by the word of his power. Sixthly, he is the one who has provided purifications for sin after he had provided purifications for sin. Look at the verse there. The emphasis shifts now from creation, from sustaining. He is ceasingly doing that because he's ceasingly God's glory. is continuously sustaining all things. But when he gave himself up on the tree, it was a one-time event at one moment. We'll discover that further as we go on through the book of Hebrews. Chapter 7, 27 gives an example here. Unlike the other high priests, he doesn't need to offer sacrifices day by day, day after day. He sacrificed for their sins once for all, one-time moment when he offered himself. No repetition, no continuous, no substitution needed now. He is God's unrepeatable sacrifice for our sin. And then it says, and then finally, this Jesus is seated at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Now with your finger, turn to chapter 7. You'll, you'll note this here. The Old Testament priest stood because his sacrifice was not permanent. It was never complete. It was a temporary one. It had to be sacrificed every year. It was only good for a slight significant period of time it wasn't permanent but when christ made his sacrifice for the sin of many it was sufficient and it was complete what does the bible say we need to pay more careful attention loved ones to what we have heard lest we drift away 
and in paying care, in careful attention to what we have heard, we need to pay attention to what we've heard about Jesus, right? Right? Because all that we hear about Jesus runs absolutely counter to what people say in a pluralistic, syncret, syncretistic world where Jesus is to be absorbed as just a great guy or another guru. And you and I have to stand up and say, no, 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 I don't believe that. And you have to tell your friends who could be your neighborly friends, some of them Mormons and some of them Jehovah Witnesses. We have to tell them, I'm sorry. I believe that Jesus is co-equal and co-eternal with the Father. Although you don't have your theology worked out yet, I understand that, but you don't even know what you're, they're teaching you. That is a flat-out contradiction to what the Bible says on the basis of the premises of what we, what we read. It is wrong. And you know we're going to have to suffer the slings and arrows and the, and, and the insults towards us because we stand for that, which comes along with, with defending the faith. And usually a lot of us are prevalent to turn away because it begins to blow us apart, tear us down, discourage us. And we might have to worry because we might slip away, slide away. And I'm telling you, loved ones, you've got to pay careful attention to this, to what you have heard, lest you drift. For the last nine and a half years of my life, out of a 17-year almost being saved, along with the leaders that I've worked with, I have labored to teach the Word of God. Why? So that you won't drift away. And some people say, why can't we just have a service where we sing all the time? Well, you know what? It, it, I understand that. That's why I like our service. We only sing two songs on the Lord's Day. We sing two songs, and it's wonderful to sing, but I don't really want to give up on what I believe, and that is teaching you, you the Word of God. Is it all right to sing songs all the time? Yeah, it's all right, but not on the Lord's Day. There's a place for singing. Why? Because I need to take every opportunity to teach you everything that I know in the Bible so that you do not drift away. And therefore, if I preach the rest of my life, I can't even preach the whole Bible. Therefore, I've got to preach as much as I can, whenever I can, wherever I can, as long as I can so you do not drift. And that I don't drift too. That's why I get sometimes a little excited in what I do from time to time because of the eternal significance that is found in this. You see, this is, this is not some kind of like good speech here. Or this, is, this is a great thought that I had that I came up with. This is a passionate longing to know Christ because I know and you know People that have drifted, friends that have drifted. I went back to America about two years ago and I met one of my old colleagues who seemed to be on fire for the Lord. And, he, and, and there's Jesus no more. He's Mr. Ex-Oblivion now. He doesn't want to hear about it anymore. He drifted away. He wasn't paying careful attention to what was being said. There could have been a time he says, oh, I know all that stuff. I don't need it anymore. I don't need to hear the gospel preached to me anymore. I'm tired of that. I'm beyond that. You know what? If you're beyond the gospel and you think that this morning, you're beyond the preaching of the gospel, you are in great danger, loved ones. There's a cosmic significance of these truths. The idea that he is the, created, the creator and sustainer of the universe, which brings an immense sense of awe within me and a sense of fear. But we have the fact that he has become a wonderful savior to me, to you. It took a miracle to put the stars in place. It took a miracle to hang the world in space. And that's some good stuff. But when he saved my soul, cleansed and made me whole, it took a miracle of love, mercy, and grace. Especially when he knew my propensity to drift, he still ushered me in to the kingdom of heaven. Let's pay careful attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Help us to be people that listen beyond our reasoning and understand. Help us to be influenced by your spirit, by the word of God, that we too one day will not drift away. We thank you for the warnings, but we also thank you for the promises that are given in this divine book. We take solace and comfort in knowing you, 
We thank you for the book of Hebrews and the wonderful, wonderful picture of Christ that is displayed here, which gives us the truth and something to turn to in our darkest, deepest moments, but also bring us the most joy and peace and comfort in knowing who Christ is through the Word. We thank you again for our church. We thank you for all that has been accomplished, and we'll thank you ahead of time for what you will accomplish through us. For it is in Christ's name we pray and give God you the glory. Amen. Church, thank you. We'll see you soon, hopefully. We love you, my family. We miss you, and God bless.